Usually I would be standing on this stage over here conducting the college orchestra because I'm a music professor. But tonight I'm going to talk about my moonlight activities in the field of science <laughs> and how they led to a cancer research lab and an important breakthrough. <clears throat> Over the past eight years, I've had the great pleasure of working with some brilliant and dedicated scientists. They were very open-minded, and we had a common dream that in the future, children would not have to suffer from cancer or from the terrible side effects of toxic drugs or radiation, because we believed there just had to be a better way. There had to be a better way, and we think we may have found it. <clears throat> a scientist said, you're killing more cancer cells than as if you had used radiation. That same scientist went on, if you had spent millions of dollars developing a new drug that killed this many cancer cells, it would be a home run. This was an astonishing thing to hear, especially for a music professor who had just completed his first experiments in a cancer lab. But we didn't use any radiation. We didn't use any drugs. So what did we do? I have here two identical tuning forks, both tuned to the note A, the note an orchestra tunes to. These forks are both made to vibrate 440 times per second. We say their frequency is 440 hertz. If I tap this fork, putting little pulses of energy into it, the second fork will also vibrate in sympathy. And if I silence this fork, we just may, may hear the other singing its tone. We say that I'm inducing a sympathetic resonant vibration in the second fork. It only works because both forks are tuned to the exact same frequency. Now, many of us have seen this very charming young man on the internet who shatters crystal glasses with his powerful voice. But if you watch him carefully, you'll see that first he taps the glass with his finger and listens. The glass sings its natural resonant pitch. Then he takes a deep breath and sings a loud, long note. He induces a resonant vibration in the crystal glass. The vibration grows larger and larger and larger until the glass is shattered. On the other end of the scale, we have a giant bridge made out of concrete and steel, a suspension bridge, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Cars and trucks and buses are going over it every day. And unfortunately, where they built this bridge, there was a steady wind blowing across it. And one day, this wind induces a small vibration in the bridge, hardly noticeable. But the frequency of the vibration matches the resonant frequency of some part of the bridge. And the vibration gets larger and larger and larger until the bridge collapses into the river below. A destructive resonant frequency. So on one end of the scale, we have a giant concrete and steel bridge destroyed by resonance. And on the other, we have a small crystal glass shattered. So maybe we could shatter something even smaller, something really small, something you would need a microscope to see. Maybe we could shatter a living microorganism. But to do that, you'd need some sort of theory to serve as a basis. And we find that basis in a wonderful book called The Rainbow and the Worm, The Physics of Organisms, by a scientist, Mei-Wan Ho. And that book makes a very strong case
that living organisms and cells are liquid crystals, or in the least, they have many properties of liquid crystals. Now, we're all familiar with liquid crystals because they are in our laptop computer screens. LCD display, liquid crystal display. And we can change the qualities of the liquid crystals in our computer screen by sending special electronic signals to it. We can change the color and the shape on the screen with these signals. So maybe we could change a biological living liquid crystal with a special electronic signal. But in order to do that, we would need some kind of device. So we search the U.S. patent database, and we find this invention by a physician, Dr. James Bear of Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's called a resonant frequency therapy device, and its purpose is to induce a resonant vibration in a living organism or cell. And there are two really important things about this device. The first is that it uses a very special kind of antenna. They take a hollow glass sphere, they evacuate the air, they put in some helium gas, and when we send in our electronic signals, the helium gas lights up like a fluorescent light. An electrified gas is called a plasma. So this is called a plasma antenna. And it has many special properties uniquely suited for this kind of work. The second important aspect about Dr. Baer's invention is that the output always pulses. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. This is very important because when you're doing research on the effects of electromagnetic waves on living organisms and cells, if the signal is constantly on, you are in danger of inducing heat in those cells. And heat causes indiscriminate destruction. And we don't want that. We want targeted destruction. So we don't have to worry about heat. And now we go to the biology laboratory, and we take Dr. Baer's device, and the hunt begins through a microscope for a frequency which will shatter a living microorganism. Now, we have a method of controlling Dr. Baer's device by an input control frequency. So if I put in, say, 100 hertz, out will come 100 pulses per second. If I put in 200 hertz, we'll get 200 pulses. So now we're searching for the magic frequency. And we start with 100 hertz, and we look through the microscope to see if anything's happening. We watch for five minutes. Nothing happens. So we try 101 hertz. We look through the scope for five minutes, and nothing happens. So we try 102, 103, and so on. Over the course of 15 months, we try hundreds and hundreds of frequencies, if not thousands, until we find the magic combination. The answer is you have to have two input frequencies, one low, one high, and the higher frequency must be 11 times the lower. It's what we musicians would call the 11th harmonic. And when we add the 11th harmonic, we begin to shatter microorganisms like a crystal glass. These are the first videos taken. We showed these videos to our friends in the biology department. They said they hadn't seen anything quite like it. Seems to be a new phenomenon. These organisms are being shattered by our electronic signals. This is a harmless organism, almost friendly, a little blepharisma. And normally, they're very fast swimmers. But when you approach a frequency to which they are vulnerable, they begin to slow down, then they stop, and then they begin to disintegrate within about three minutes. So now we know we can destroy a microorganism. And the question comes up, 
But can you target a specific organism with a specific frequency? So in this next video, you'll see a large organism in the center, a paramecium, undergoing disintegration, and swimming all around it, a tiny different organism, which is unharmed. If we're lucky, we'll also hear the audio as I narrate the experiment live in a noisy lab. Perhaps you can see this sort of fireworks effect happening in the growing blister to the right of the organism. And here comes a little neighbor wondering what's going on. Who's testing? And you can see blisters forming now on the lower left quadrant and upper left quadrant. The shape is now changing. And a major explosion out the top. <clears throat> so now we have some evidence that we can target specific microorganisms with specific frequencies. And we make several more videos and we film the destruction of hundreds of microorganisms. And about this time, we meet a cancer researcher and we show them these videos. And this results in an invitation to spend four months in a cancer research lab trying to shatter cancer cells. This is our setup in the lab. You can see the microscope with cancer cells on it. Here's the plasma tube. And here is my little frequency control box. So first we attack pancreatic cancer. Take a good look at this slide, because the next one will look quite different. After we treat these cells, they change their shape and size, and they begin to grow long, rope-like structures out the sides. They look something like antennas. I call them bioantennas for biological antennas. It's as if the cancer cells are trying to tune in to our signal. It also turns out this is the beginning of a process of destruction for cancer cells. We now know that cancer is vulnerable between the frequencies of 100,000 hertz and 300,000 hertz. So now we attack leukemia cells. Leukemia cell number one tries to grow a copy of itself, but the new cell is shattered into dozens of fragments and scattered across the slide. Leukemia cell number two then hyperinflates and also dies. Leukemia cell number three then tries to make another cancer cell. The new cell is shattered, and the original cell dies. But killing a handful of leukemia cells is not enough for a patient. What kind of numbers can we do? In repeated controlled laboratory experiments, independently assayed by the two top experts. We killed an average of 25% to 42% of the leukemia cells, as high as 60%. They also determined that we slowed the growth rate of the cancer by as much as 65%, so a double effect. Now we attack ovarian cancer cells. This is a more distant shot. Here you see brackets coming up around the cells, showing groups of ovarian cancer cells which are being destroyed. You can see by the end of the video that a great many ovarian cancer cells were destroyed. Now we attack pancreatic cancer once more. In the center of the screen is a clump of pancreatic cancer cells like a microtumor under the microscope. We turn on our electronic signals and the tumor shrinks and is broken up. The cells are disconnecting, disaggregating, the opposite of forming a tumor and some of the cells are destroyed.
In our most recent work, we attacked the deadly organism MRSA. MRSA is particularly dangerous because it's resistant to many common antibiotics. Thousands of people die every year from MRSA. They have drugs for it, but it has, they have very toxic side effects. We found that our electronic signals could actually eliminate antibiotic resistance in MRSA. Then by adding a very small amount of a common antibiotic, we were able to kill MRSA and slow its growth rate. Since I was a 17-year-old high school student with twin interests in both music and science, I never imagined the two would come together in a cancer research lab. I now believe that the future cancer treatment rooms for children will be a very different place. It will be a pleasant place where children gather and make new friends. They probably won't even know they're sick. They'll draw pictures, color in their books, play with their toys, all the while unaware that above them are beautiful blue, pinkish plasma lights emanating healing, pulsing electric fields, shattering their cancer painlessly and non-toxically, one cell at a time. Thank you.